gentles and ladymen, peanut butter. I think I speak a great truth when I say that we collectively adore peanut butter in so far as we're not deathly allergic. In which case, I hope that you don't adore peanut butter because that would be very sad. A case of the forbidden fruit. I just so happen to be a big fan of peanut butter also. You know, I think it's actually one of the greatest things ever invented. If there's ever an excuse for me to put peanut butter in something or on something or around something, you can be sure that Dylan Hollis is going to do it. And it was precisely this love for peanut butter which inspired me to bake a 1932 Great Depression recipe on peanut butter bread. I uploaded this TikTok in late January of 2022, baking the peanut butter bread, and it has now almost 23 million views, which is insane, and it will soon become my most viewed TikTok, which I find quite intriguing because it's not a particularly quirky recipe. It's from the Great Depression, which means it's not very interesting nor elaborate in regards to its ingredients. In fact, it's quite the opposite, but it does highlight a firm belief of mine, and that is good baked goods do not need to be complicated nor fancy. Too often on social media do we see crazy recipes for things like brownies that take 48 hours to make, or a 100-hour chocolate cake, or the best French macarons free of all imperfections, and it doesn't need to be the case. Sometimes we just want recipes which are simple, easy, devoid of skill, can be made with things in your kitchen, and taste incredible. So that is precisely what you and I are going to be doing here today. We're going to be baking the original Great Depression 1932 peanut butter bread recipe that I did on my TikTok. We're going to be visiting a 1945 iteration. And then finally, we're going to be baking a recipe of my own. I will say this again. What I love the most about this recipe is just how dead easy it is. I can tell you a door hinge could make this. If you add all of these ingredients into one bowl, mix it up a little, and bake it, you're gonna end up with some bread. And some good bread at that. Please do pardon my kitchen. It's not the most glamorous thing you've ever seen, but it is utilitarian if nothing else. Now, the recipe begins with two cups of flour. Ideally, you should be spooning your flour into your cup and then, you know, leveling it off. But ask me if I ever do that. Next up, we have four whole teaspoons of baking powder. And it's customary for me to refer to leavening agents as floofers. It's just uh, my thing. So this would be floof powder. Now, I'm not quite sure as to why this bread requires so much baking powder. It'd be interesting to hear you guys' opinions on that. Uh, of course, this bread does not contain any eggs, so that could play a part. A lot of people posit that peanut butter, being so dense and fatty, uh, needs this much baking powder to let it rise, but I can't say that peanut butter is that much more dense than regular butter. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think butter has more fat than peanut butter. Next in is a mere quarter cup of sugar, which I did not almost forget. To finish off the dry ingredients, we add in a pinch of salt, that was a half teaspoon, and then we just whisk this in to disperse the leavening. Why does it look and feel so strange to whisk with your non-dominant hand? <laughs> looks like I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but still. Moving to the wet ingredients, we'll be using one and one third cup of milk. I think it's important to note that I use whole milk. I think anything less is preposterous. Let's now have a chat about this recipe's feature presentation of peanut butter. Why is it used, how it's used, and what makes this a Great Depression recipe? Peanut butter has a few advantages over regular butter, especially considering the times of the Great Depression, mainly being the fact that this was shelf stable. Butter was a prized ingredient that could be used in many things. You'd be wanting to use it for dinners and feeding your family nutritional food. Nothing as superfluous as a dessert or a quick bread. This was made even more important if you were living within the hard-hit cities during the Depression, where dairy and fresh produce were extremely coveted. So not only did peanut butter act as the necessary fat within your quick bread, meaning you could save your butter for dinner, but it also imparted a flavor component at the same time. Two birds with one stone. When speaking about this stuff, however, I must tell you that I am no historian nor food historian. I have a music degree and I make videos on TikTok. If you're properly interested in learning more about food history, I have a few contemporaries of mine here on YouTube who are a lot more knowledgeable than I, mainly Glenn from Glenn and Friends Cooking and Max Miller from Tasting History. I will link them below. Glenn is actually a huge inspiration of mine, and many of the recipes that I've done, he's done months if not years prior to me. All the while, he actually teaches his viewers and doesn't just yell. This recipe calls for a half cup of peanut butter, so measure that out as best you can. Use whatever brand you'd like, of course. I'm just using Peter Pan because it's one of the first peanut butter brands that came to the market. Mix it all up. And then we turn this into a buttered and floured or an oiled loaf tin. Now, by no means do you have to score this like this with a knife. I just do it because quick breads always have a tendency to split down the center, and I just like to give it a helping hand. This here bakes at 325 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour and 10 minutes, though I would start checking it around an hour with a toothpick. 
If it comes out clean, it's done. Friends, I reckon we have a done peanut butter bread here. Mine took an hour and 10 minutes on the dot. Of course, your baking times will vary depending on your altitude, but uh, it smells good. Now, I like to let mine cool in the pan until the point where I can grasp it without burning myself, but then I turn it out and then put it on a cooling rack and voila. Can't rightly say it's the prettiest looking thing. It's a bit rustic, but boy, does it smell good. But does it taste good? Well, yes, that's why I've made this video. I'm quite familiar with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, that's just quite brilliant. It's got the right amount of sweetness. It's got a perfect note of peanut butter. It is one of my favorite breads. However, the distinction is in the name. It is a bread. It's something on which to put butter or jam. It's not a cake. You know, we have been spoiled with breads like banana bread, which over the years have gotten really quite sweet and really more so of a dessert. And that's not the case with this. With that being said, it doesn't have to be like that. I am all for full blown peanut butter sweetness. So let's take a look at another recipe, shall we? Alrighty then, day two and peanut butter bread number two. This time we're going back to the year 1945, where King George was still on the throne and Harry Truman was the president of the United States. The peanut butter bread recipe in question comes from this cookbook. It's the Household Magazine Searchlight Recipe Book, published in Topeka, Kansas in 45. It was sent in by a viewer of mine, so Thank you most kindly. This is fast becoming one of my favorite cookbooks because the household searchlight sort of acted as one of America's first test kitchens where it would gather good famous recipes from around the United States. They would test them at the household searchlight and then release this book through the household magazines to the masses. And this book doesn't just deal in the currency of desserts. It concerns everything from beverages to cheeses to candies to pastries to poultry. Of course, our concern today is peanut butter bread. So on page 48 of this cookbook under the miscellaneous tabs of the bread section is the peanut butter bread recipe. And just at a quick glance, you will notice that it shares quite a lot of similarities with our first recipe, namely the same amount of flour and baking powder. However, there are some alterations. It doesn't only double the salt, it doubles the sugar as well. It slightly cuts back on the milk and adds a tad more peanut butter. It also carries with it more specificity in regards to the method. We will be working with our hands with this one, but more pressing and more importantly is it cuts the baking time in half by baking this loaf at 420 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's get started and see what 1945 has to offer. Just as we've done before, we start with two cups of flour, four teaspoons of baking powder, add a full teaspoon of salt, and then we sift. Now I normally don't sift my flour or my dry ingredients like this, but I'm doing this just because it's asked me. Next up is our two thirds of a cup of peanut butter and I'll be using the same brand just to keep it even. Now our new half cup of sugar. The jacket's coming off. After you wash your hands, in you go. Woo. Interesting. What a bizarre texture. Woo. We're just working this in like pie pastry, I suppose. It does actually manage to hold its shape quite well. That's done. Now just one cup of milk and we mix lightly but thoroughly. Hmm. It's still quite a stiff batter. In you go. I have noticed that you do want to press these into the pan because they don't move rightly enough. Let's see what 420 for half an hour does to this thing. So it has been 30 minutes, and as you can see, it looks rather brown. I don't reckon it needs the other five. But it does. So it has been 30, mm, it has been 35 minutes, and regardless of whether or not a toothpick comes out clean, I am uh, just going to pull this and let it fend for itself. So here we are, bread number two. With the higher temperature and the higher sugar content, you can see we've got quite a nice brown crust on the exterior. By the smells of it, maybe a little bit too brown. The interior, however, is fine. All right. Mm. You know, I quite like that. The browning and the crust poses no issue at all to taste. In fact, it's a really nice textural change. Um, it does not taste as dry as it looks, but still, I'm not sold at the 420 degrees thing. The added sweetness and the extra peanut butter is certainly the way to go. We are no longer in the Great Depression. No, in fact, it's a few days later in 2022, and today we'll be making, and I'll be giving you, my peanut butter bread recipe. My eyebrows are a bit calmer today, too. They're, they're always a bit angsty on day one, aren't they? Now, when I set out to create this recipe, my goal was simple. I wanted to make a peanut butter bread which was as full of peanut butter flavor as possible. I wanted it to be a bit more dessert-like to satisfy those with a sweet tooth, such as myself, and unlike the two previous loaves, I wanted it to be like the 
peanut butter version of banana bread. And if you've happened to notice what's behind my shoulder, you may be able to tell that it's proving to be an immensely difficult task, at times absolutely Sisyphean. I don't possess the ego to deny that it's taken me no less than seven loaves, seven experiments to find a peanut butter bread that I'm proud of. Dylan, you say, seven failed attempts. How hard can it be? Just add more peanut butter, do this, do that. Well, <laughs> It's not that simple. <laughs> I'm still a bit manic, sorry. Because the same qualities which made peanut butter great to bake with in the Great Depression, namely being the fact that it acted as both the fat and the flavoring, makes it immensely difficult when it comes to wanting to add more flavor. Because then you're adding more fat. And when you add more fat, you need to account for that with more dry ingredients, uh, different leavening, uh, different combinations of wet ingredients. And you just keep making a larger and larger loaf to account for the added fat, and it ends up being the same same amount of flavor. It is vexing. Even when I did vary the baking times or the baking temperatures or the leavening agents, adding more peanut butter flavor by adding more peanut butter either caused the loaf to collapse or fail to rise completely. And when I did manage to stabilize a loaf, it had the same mouthfeel as a mouthful of peanut butter. That is, it isn't dry, but it feels dry. Complicating things was the fact that how the peanut butter was added played a very important role. For example, here is a loaf where one cup of peanut butter was added to the flour like we did in the 1945 recipe with your fingies. It had the most beautiful peanut butter taste, but it failed to rise. And here is another loaf with the exact same ingredients baked in the exact same way, except the peanut butter was added with the wet ingredients like you would in any other baking recipe. It rose beautifully, but the peanut butter taste was gone. Absolutely deactivated. I, I was so confused. Also, I found peanut extracts and peanut butter flavorings to be absolutely disgusting. I reckoned that powdered peanut butter would be the answer to my woes, but it ends up causing quite a burnt or bitter taste when baked, and I was not pleased. But I did end up perfecting it. I cracked the code. I found what I was looking for, and I've created something which I adore. I think you will too, and it's for peanut butter lovers everywhere, so. Let's get to baking. After I freeze these, of course. That's my breakfast and afternoon tea for six months. My recipe, like all others before it, starts with two level cups of all-purpose flour, into which goes one full teaspoon of salt. Now, if you're using a fine grain salt and not a coarse kosher salt like I'm using here, do consider only using half a teaspoon, but the salt is important because the flavor of peanut butter as we know it is married to saltiness. So this helps bring out that peanut butter oomph. Next in is only one teaspoon of baking powder. Now, I know that seems a drastic difference from the previous two loaves which had four teaspoons but around that range baking powder can actually impart a taste of its own onto baked goods and that's something we want to avoid with a sweet loaf such as this give this a whisk up now for the peanut butter we'll be using an entire cup and you can use any brand you want I've been testing all of these with Jif because it's my favorite and I know what you're thinking can I use chunky peanut butter and of course you can it just imparts more of a roasty flavor uh, to your bread so if you kind of like that go ahead the only peanut butters which don't work with this are the natural or the organic peanut butters, those which don't contain emulsifiers. Any brand like Jif or Peter Pan or Skippy, the shelf stable ones, will work with this just fine. Now comes the magic part, combining the peanut butter and the dry ingredients with your fingertips. I'm telling you, this is the secret. It's what keeps the peanut butter flavor in the bread through baking. It's as if it amplifies the flavor, and I couldn't tell you why, but perhaps somebody here could tell me what's going on. When it starts looking and feeling like damp sand, then you're done. Now my choice of wet ingredients are quite different from the other recipes, but you'll have to trust me on this one. We do still use milk, whole milk, make sure it's at room temperature, but I do add an egg. It's important to lift up and create rise with all of that peanut butter which we added, and our sugar will be whisked into said egg. No, but the major difference here is applesauce, sweetened applesauce. I find it acts not only as a complementary flavor to our peanut butter, but it adds the moisture that we need that doesn't dry out through baking, and it also acts as the acid component for our baking soda, which accounts for the lack of baking powder, and I think creates a better, more stable rise. So, into a separate bowl goes one egg at room temperature. Temperature. Adding to it three quarters of a cup of white sugar. Then we beat these two together with a whisk until light and fluffy. That is good by me. Next in is our applesauce, and I call for one cup. And we're switching to a spatula now to incorporate this, plus a half cup of milk. Now this next step is crucial and things need to happen quite fast. So make sure you have your oven already preheated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and you have a greased loaf tin at the ready. Into the wet ingredients goes half a teaspoon of baking soda. Briefly mix that in, and then quickly add the wet ingredients to the dry. And we combine this just barely. And that's all it needs, and into the pan. You'll notice that this batter is quite loose, and that's okay. And then into a 350 degree Fahrenheit oven for around an hour to an hour and 10 minutes. Now I suppose the conversation might eventually move to, can I put anything in it? And the answer is yes, I'm quite sure that this quick bread would hold a cup of nuts, a cup of chalky chips, 
um, anything you could think of, really. The only thing that doesn't work well with this, strangely enough, are things like spices or vanilla extract. Of course, vanilla extract is in everything, so you'd think it would work in this, but it doesn't. It steals away some of the flavor from the peanut butter, and it doesn't add much at all. The same thing with spices like simonim or nutmeg. Even at concentrations of about a half teaspoon, it becomes overpowering, and it's the strangest thing. Peanut butter has proven to be one of the most difficult things to bake with, in my opinion. All right, my peanut butter bread is done. This took an hour precisely, and all we're gonna do is let this rest on a cooling rack for a little bit, and then we'll turn it out. Gentles and ladies, and here she is, our peanut butter bread. You know, considering the last few days, you have no idea how glad I am to see this risen bread. The exterior is a nice golden deep brown. It's a little bit darker than the other loaves, and that's just because of the added sugar, the added egg, and the baking soda actually helps it brown as well. The cracks are good and typical for a quick bread which is baked properly and then the chunkiness that you see on top is just because of the way in which we mixed in the peanut butter. Through the crust is a beautiful interior with a good crumb and it should be nice and moist. Alrighty. Hello there. <laughs> mm. The peanut butter flavor is front and center. It has a lovely chewiness to it. Again, it's got a great amount of moisture in there. You might ask, can you taste the applesauce? Yes, you can. Again, it's complimentary to the peanut butter, um, but it is mainly there for moisture. I'm quite proud of this. I mean, it's only taken me seven tries. Oh, it's really good. This one definitely stands more on its own. It's more of a dessert to be had with afternoon tea by itself. Whereas the other ones, you know, you put butter on it. Maybe you put peanut butter on it or jam. It was meant to be an ancillary part of a meal. And the great thing about these is that you can pick whatever you want. 1945, interesting. <laughs> and then of course you have mine, which I'm partial to because it's mine. Through all of this, I've learned a lot, but the main thing is that I've learned I still love peanut butter. And if you do too, go ahead and bake some bread. So that's it for me today. Until next time.